Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lapos of the House, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. We just listened to a great song by Chris Tomlin on spiritual warfare, which is our subject for tonight in a little more detail because we'll be covering when demons oppress, when demons oppress. Very important to know because uh, it fills in the blanks that I left uh, from the Bible study last week and from the message on satanic oppression that I did two Sundays ago. So in order to start tonight, I'm going to ask Caroline to open up in prayer. Caroline, would you pray, please? Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord God. We uh, come to you humbly, gather around your word, and we look forward to the, the scriptures that pastor is going to share with us and the insight uh, that you have given him and taught him over the years with everything that he has come across, Lord. And I'm so grateful that we have a pastor who uh, teaches us according to your word, Lord God, and, and not according to any mysticism, Lord. We're blessed uh, to have the uncompromised word. So we treasure it and we look forward to hearing it in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. We're going to show you a couple of short videos that will lay a foundation for what we are about to study. These videos pretty well agree with my position on spiritual warfare. So let's begin with the first one, which is right here. Here we go. What is spiritual warfare? Welcome to the One Minute Apologist. One Minute Apologist. Apologetic seeks to give credible answers to curious questions, to give a defense. What is spiritual warfare? When a Christian refers to spiritual warfare, what they're talking about is this battle that takes place in the unseen world. We know that the evil one is a created being. He is not equal with God. He doesn't have the same attributes of God, yet he's a lot more powerful than we are. And so the, the Satan and his minions want to uh, oppress your life as believers. Now, as a believer, you cannot be possessed, but you can be oppressed and he'll seek to do whatever he can to wear you down through doubts, through worries, through fears, through condemnation, through depression, through messing up your marriage, through causing you to get distracted by creating worldliness. And we need to be aware that our battle is not against flesh and blood as we see in Ephesians chapter 6. But there is an unseen world and there is a spiritual battle taking place. And I would encourage you to read Ephesians 6 where Paul talks about putting on the armor of God whereby you could be spiritually protected. So we need to realize when we look at the scriptures that there is the Satan who is after you. There is the adversary, the evil one, the devil who wants to render you powerless and defeated as a believer. And we also can be encouraged by remembering as 1 John 4, 4 says, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. But remember that the enemy is like a roaring lion. He roams around seeking whom he may devour. So let's remember James 4, 7. Submit to God then. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay, that's the first video. And now here's the second one, which is about four minutes long, also on the topic of spiritual warfare and very much in line with my position on the subject. So here we go. Ready? What does the Bible say about spiritual warfare? Today's question is, what does the Bible say about spiritual warfare? In this video, I'll answer that question from a biblical perspective. And afterwards, as always, I'll share some helpful resources. So stick around to the end. There are two primary errors when it comes to spiritual warfare, overemphasis and underemphasis. Some blame every sin every conflict and every problem on demons that need to be cast out. Others completely ignore the spiritual realm and the fact that the Bible tells us our battle is against spiritual powers. The key to successful spiritual warfare is finding the biblical balance. Jesus sometimes cast demons out of people. Other times, he healed people with no mention of the demonic. The Apostle Paul instructs Christians to wage war against the sin in themselves, Romans chapter 6, and warns us to oppose the schemes of the devil, Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 12 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This text teaches some critical truths. We can only stand strong in the Lord's power. It is God's armor that protects us, and our battle is ultimately against spiritual forces of evil in the world. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 18 is a description of the spiritual armor God gives us. We are to stand firm with the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, and by praying in the spirit. What do these pieces of spiritual armor represent in spiritual warfare? We are to know the truth, believe the truth, and speak the truth. We are to rest in the fact that we are declared righteous because of Christ's sacrifice for us. We are to proclaim the gospel no matter how much resistance we face. We are not to waver in our faith, trusting God's promises no matter how strongly we are attacked. Our ultimate defense is the assurance we have of our salvation, an assurance that no spiritual force can take away. Our offensive weapon is the Word of God, not our own opinions and feelings. And we are to pray in the power and will of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is our ultimate example of resisting temptation in spiritual warfare. Observe how Jesus handled direct attacks from Satan when he was tempted in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Each temptation was combated with the words, it is written. The word of the living God is the most powerful weapon against the temptations of the devil. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm chapter 119, verse 11. A word of caution concerning spiritual warfare is in order. The name of Jesus is not a magical incantation that causes demons to flee before us. The seven sons of Siva are an example of what can happen when people presume an authority they have not been given. Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. Even Michael, the archangel, did not rebuke Satan in his own power, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Jude chapter 1, verse 9. When we start talking to the devil, we run the risk of being led astray as Eve was. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Our focus should be on God, not demons. We speak to Him, not them. In summary, what are the keys to success in spiritual warfare? We rely on God's power, not our own. We put on the whole armor of God. We draw on the power of Scripture. The Word of God is the Spirit's sword. We pray in perseverance and holiness, making our appeal to God. We stand firm. We submit to God. We resist the devil's work knowing that the Lord of hosts is our protector. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Psalm chapter 62, verse 2. Want to learn more? Subscribe. Okay, that I think was uh, very, very helpful. The thing that I want to extract from that before we continue is that he said that the problems in the church today regarding spiritual warfare are overemphasis on demonic activity and underemphasis on demonic, demonic activity, and I agree, agree with him 100%. Demons are not responsible for every terrible thing that happens to us. I said in my sermon two Sundays ago that sometimes it's just life, sometimes it's the flesh. There are many, many factors involved. So uh, what we don't want to do is be obsessed with demons, looking for them under every corner. And uh, I maintain to this day that the deliverance ministry industry focuses very much on the fact that there are demons everywhere and we're constantly fighting them and we're always constantly battling and this battle rages on day after day and year after year and it never ends. And I totally disagree with that. However, there is an underemphasis as well. And the underemphasis is that Christians cannot be oppressed by demons. I completely disagree with that. Christians certainly can be oppressed with demons. And we're going to find out when and why and where and how Christians can be oppressed by demons in this Bible study. So we don't want to overemphasize deliverance, and we don't want to ignore it and underemphasize it. We want to find that balance that the preacher was talking about in one of the videos. So let's begin by going to the scriptures, or at least the Bible study notes. Here we go. All right, let's go back to the beginning. Now, here are some artist depictions of spiritual warfare that I thought were pretty interesting. This one here, a man is praying and raising his hands in worship, I suppose, and there's a battle going on in heaven between angels and demons. Here we have a girl who is confronting a demonic spirit. I don't know what she's doing. She could be praying. She could be proclaiming the word of God. And here's another great picture, which I really like. Somebody with the armor of God and even wings. I, I would assume that's an angel, but I like to think it's a believer. 
And here we have a demonic entity here. And these are great artist depictions. And it reminds us that there are things going on in the supernatural uh, between God's, the forces of the kingdom of God and the forces of the kingdom of darkness. And that we are kind of like the battleground between the two because Satan does not have any power to attack God directly, but he can attack God's favored creation, which is man. And uh, the reason for that is because man has been given a status and man has been given a relationship that the devil envies. He wanted to be the one that would share in God's glory. He wanted to be the one that would partake in the divine nature, but he was not allowed that at all. And those things are promised to us through our salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. The other thing is, is that these pictures remind me that I don't really want to see what's going on in the supernatural when we engage in spiritual warfare, because I think it would frighten us to no end. So in God's wisdom, we don't see what's going on when we pray, when we take authority. And it's probably, in fact, I'm sure it is for the better. Now we're going to start off the Bible study by looking at this poster here. And it says, bow down, Satan, you are a defeated foe. And there's the hand of Jesus taking the hand of Satan and disarming him from his bloody sword. Down here, it says, everything must come subject to Jesus Christ. Amen. And that brings us to our first point, which is that Satan is not God's opposite equal. This is so important because some Christians treat him as if he is. He is not God's opposite equal. He is far, far, far below him in power and in scope. Now, here's the scripture verse to back that up. It comes from Ezekiel 28. Here's, this was directed initially to the king of Tyre, but if you read the passage, you'll see that this couldn't possibly apply to a human being. Uh, it applies to Satan, the devil. So here we go. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. We're trying to establish that Satan is not God's opposite equal. So listen carefully. You are in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. That is a spectacular creature, let me tell you. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. Apparently, the devil is a musician. Remarkable. Well, we all know that he led the sons of God in worship before he fell. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I established you. That means that he had access to the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, more so than any other angel or archangel. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walk back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. He was pretty close to God. You were perfect in your ways from the days that you were created until iniquity was found in you. Well, what was his iniquity? We're going to find out beginning in verse 16. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out as a profane thing. What, what does that mean by the abundance of your trading? Well, he realized how splendid and spectacular he was. And as a result of that, he became filled with pride and wanted to ascend into the place of God. He wanted to be like God. And you'll find that in Isaiah 14, beginning at verse 11. But we're, gonna, we're not going to look at that tonight. Let us just continue for in Ezekiel. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Ah, oh, there's the explanation right there. He thought he knew he was beautiful and his pride overwhelmed him. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst and it devoured you. And I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you amongst the people are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Now, this part here, I cast you down to the ground. That's already happened because Satan was kicked out of heaven for wanting to aspire to the level of God. But down here, bringing a fire from his midst and turning him to ashes and bringing him to the place where he shall be no more. That's a prophecy. That has not happened yet, but it will. Here's another scripture passage that demonstrates that the devil is far, far beneath God in power and in scope. Jesus is talking to 70 disciples who returned, and when they returned, they returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, and this is very important, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. 
How did Jesus see Satan fall like lightning from heaven? I would speculate to say that it was Jesus himself who threw Satan out. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So this, these two passages establish the fact that Satan is not God's equal opposite, and he is far, far below him in power and in scope. So that's the first thing that we need to learn and really allow to penetrate our hearts before we continue our study of spiritual warfare. Now, the next passages, I'm going to let you determine what the passage are saying. So let me know what, you're le what you learn about spiritual warfare and the enemy's activity through these passages that are coming up. Here's the first one. Job chapter 1, 6 to 12. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? And so Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, my servant Job, that there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And so Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household and around all he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all he has and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. And so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now think about what you've learned from that passage. Here's the next one. This is the Apostle Paul talking about his visit to the kingdom of God. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's what he says. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ, that's himself, by the way, who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up into the third heaven. That's the kingdom of God, where the Lord dwells. I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I may desire to boast, I shall not be a fool, for I speak the truth. But I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. What was the thorn? A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. What do these verses tell you? He tells you that David, the devil is subject to God and he can do nothing that the Lord does not allow. Satanic affliction can be for a short time or a prolonged time, but it always works into God's purpose. Now, what was the purpose of Satan being afflicted in the life of Job? Anybody? Somebody tell me why Job was aff afflicted. What was the purpose that God would allow Job to be afflicted? Anyone? It's right in the passage. That he wouldn't curse God regardless of what Satan would do to him. Now, what was Satan's proposal? That's the correct answer. But what was Satan's proposal? What did Satan say about Job? That he would curse God. That he would curse God if God did what? Took away his blessings. Took away his blessings. Okay, so what was this... This is what I call a satanic wager. This was like a bet against the Lord's righteousness. So what was Satan saying to God? That if you take away his blessings, he'll curse you to your face. So what was God's response? Anyone? Well, that you can uh, allow allow him for uh, to oppress him, but not to uh, to kill Job. Okay, so what does that tell you about the devil's power? He's limited. Exactly. He's limited. Now, here's what the situation was. The purpose of God in allowing Satan to tempt Job was to show him that the righteous worship God 
for who he is and not for what he does. They worship him because of who he is, not because of the blessings that he gives. Now, I hope that that's true in the lives of all of you, because if you worship God for blessings, if the blessings should ever stop, or if you ever fall into adversity, if things start going wrong, you may, you may stop worshiping, you may get less diligent about reading the word of God, and you may fall into the trap that the devil has set, uh, or the, the wager that the devil made that the righteous will not stop serving God if he withdraws blessings. So the purpose was to show that Job and anyone righteous would never give up on God because of who he is. And did Job succeed? Anybody read the book of Job? Did yes. He, yeah, he did succeed. Okay. Now, what was the purpose? We'll go on to the next question now. We read this passage here about Paul. We realize that in the case of Job, it was to show the devil that someone who loves him, loves God, will not sell out for any reason. That's the purpose. What was the purpose for Paul? Why did the Lord allow Satan to afflict Paul? And here's a case where a Christian is being oppressed. To keep him humble. To keep him humble. Why would he, why would, uh, well, why would he want to keep him humble in that way, Tom? What do you think? Well, maybe Paul went to heaven. He would have. I mean, the flesh wants to always boast. Uh huh. So uh, I believe that was a way for God to, to keep him in his place. Okay. So the Lord allowed Satan to afflict Paul because Paul had a tendency or might have had a tendency to become proud because of the revelations that he had in heaven. I find that very interesting because the apostle John also was brought into the kingdom of God and saw heaven in the book of Revelation. Yet there was no affliction from the devil in his case. And why would that be anyone? Why would that be? John he was, the, was, he, was yeah. he was the apostle of love. He was the apostle of love. But so what does that tell you? Well, that he was he was humble. He was humble already. He it's was humble point. already. So there was no need for him to be afflicted. But Paul had the potential to be proud. So the Lord allowed the devil to afflict him for the purpose of keeping him humble. John's case wasn't necessary because he was the apostle of love, as Mark said, and it was an affliction from the enemy was not necessary. So the Lord uh, will do Pastor, whatever. Yeah. Pastor, I wonder if, 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 if uh, John had already be, been uh, tried and tested, so he had proved himself worthy to be, you know. Well, John had been thrown into a vat of boiling oil yeah. before that. And yeah. instead of dying, he was refreshed. Okay, yeah. let's move on. Prolonged satanic affliction can happen in two instances. Doesn't always happen in these two instances because God will use other means to uh, correct his saints and to test his saints. However, prolonged satanic affliction can happen in these two instances because we're answering the question, why are some Christians oppressed by the enemy? What is the purpose? What is the reason for the oppression of Christians? One, they are in sin and they're not walking in holiness. That would be one reason for satanic affliction. Two, one is being purposely tested who will prevail by the Spirit of God. Now let's look at the first one. One is in sin and not walking in holiness. When will deliverance come in that case? Anyone? If somebody's in sin and they're being afflicted by Satan, when will, when will deliverance come? When, you repent. when they repent of their sin? Oh, yes, when they repent of their sins. Now, what happens if somebody tries to cast the enemy out of their of that area of their life and they haven't repented? It's not going to work because it's not the root of the problem. Ah, well, not, it's not going to work because of the root of the problem. So we've learned something. We've learned that deliverance in the life of a Christian cannot happen unless they repent if the issue is they're living in sin. Very good, everybody. I hope you're taking notes. And if not, I'll send you the notes tomorrow anyway in a PDF. Okay, now the next one is, one is being purposely tested who will prevail by the Spirit of God. I'm going to ask you for a personal testimony here. Is there anybody here who can give a testimony of being attacked by the enemy, but prevailing and having developed a, a stronger character as a result? Can anybody share something along that, those lines? Because the, the Lord will allow demonic affliction to build you up. His grace is sufficient for you. Anybody in that category? 
No one. Okay. Well, that would th consider yourself blessed then. Yeah. I, I uh, when I was rock climbing. Yeah. I was very um. How should I say? I was very daredevilish. Uh huh. I uh, sometimes like to climb without a rope, and I would take extreme, oh boy. extreme chances with my life, and I, I'd uh, climb size of buildings, and uh, oh. I was almost like uh, mocking, mocking, tempting the devil, so to speak. Yeah, and you you paid the price for it anyway, didn't I you? I paid the price. Uh, look, all you all you need to do is look at the scars and look at the broken shoulder, and yeah, you fell <laughs> you fell twenty feet, right? Yeah, I fell 20 feet. I was in coma for about a month and uh, took me a good year to come out of my um, brain my brain challenges. Okay, so we've established that sometimes the Lord will allow satanic affliction because somebody is living in sin and will not repent or to push them out of the sin, to motivate them to get out of the sin. Two, he will allow satanic affliction on occasion, not always, eh? Remember that it's not always the case, but it potentially is the case that God will allow satanic affliction to build up some part of Christ-like character in you because he knows you will prevail. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, he will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. And sometimes the temptation is demonic affliction. And because of that, you grow and you become better in the Lord. And I've got a bunch of testimonies <laughs> along those lines, but they're too private to share. But take my word for it. I have been a mess and uh, I have been oppressed in my life. And because of God's grace and because of the spirit of God living in me and his tremendous power, I was able to overcome and I've become a better man because of it. And uh, I, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. And I think uh, this, this could speak for a lot of us. Okay. Uh, when we came to the Lord, I'm sure a lot of us were still, you know, hanging on to certain bondages in our life. Yeah. That we weren't free from uh -huh. so the lord in his divine way yeah um delivers us from some of them and sometimes you know others kind of like hang on okay we're and, gonna and, yeah, yeah i wanted to ask you you know what your thought was uh, you know, no when, problem we're gonna actually address that a little later in the bible study. okay all right just okay. hang in there and we're gonna get to it all right so let's move on I hope you're all enjoying this so far. All right, let's see what we can learn from the following verses. You tell me. Mark 3.15 says, we have authority to cast out demons. Matthew 10.1 says, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Mark 6.7 says, he summoned the 12 and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over unclean spirits. Luke 9, 1 says he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. Luke 10, 19 is general because you would think from the verses that we just read, it was only the apostles. Not true. Luke 10, 19 says, behold, I have given you, that is all of you listening, authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. Mark 6, 13 says, and they went around casting many demons and we're anointing oil, uh, sick people with oil and healing them. And Matthew 10, 8, a, a commission from the Lord for all of us. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And then there's the testimony here that the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And then finally, 1 John 2, 14 says, I have written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So from those verses, what have you learned about the devil and about believers? Just from those verses. Anyone. Should be obvious. Through Christ, we have the power and authority over the devil. That's correct. We have the power and authority over the devil. And those verses are only one of another. Oh, I'd say, I don't know how many I actually quoted, but there's about a hundred verses in the scripture that makes it very clear that we have complete authority over demonic spirits and not the other way around. He has no authority over believers. It is the other way around. 
Serpents and scorpions refer to evil spirits, and we have authority over how much of the enemy? How much of the enemy's power do we have authority over? Anyway. All. 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 Where does it say that? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Wait a minute. I think it's here. Yes. <laughs> over all the power of the enemy. Well, that's very interesting because there's nothing that the enemy can do that we Christians can not undo. Very important. Extremely important. Now, that doesn't mean he won't oppress us, but it does mean that if he does oppress us or any of us, we can deal with him. Remember that. We can deal with him. Why then are some Christians oppressed by the enemy? If we have authority over him, why then are some Christians oppressed by the enemy? And is it even possible for Christians to be oppressed? Anyone? Let's, let's do the second one first. Is it possible for Christians to be oppressed by the enemy? If you say yes, give me a thumbs up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Almost everybody agrees. Yes, Christians can be oppressed. You all get a bunny sticker. You're right. Christians can be oppressed by the enemy. Now we're going to find out how they are oppressed. So here we go. You ready? Let's continue. First of all, let's establish that it is possible for Christians to be oppressed. Otherwise, the following verses would be, uh, they would be irrelevant. 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This was directed towards married couples. The importance of praying together and uh, coming together so that the devil will not tempt us because of our lack of self-control. So yes, it's possible for Christians to be oppressed. Acts 5, 3. Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart and that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Well, this was a situation where two Christians, Ananias and Sapphira, sold their land, gave a part of it to the apostles and pretended that they were giving it all. And they lied to the Holy Spirit. And it was Satan who filled their hearts. Here it is here. Satan filled their hearts. So yes, Christians can be oppressed and deceived by the devil. Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Who are the schemes directed at? Who is this verse directed at? This verse is directed to Christians. So we know that the schemes of the devil are aimed at Christians. Yes, it is possible for Christians to be oppressed. Revelation 20, 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the devil can deceive people. Can he deceive Christians? Absolutely. Now, this refers to non-Christians, but we know from our own experience and from the word of God that Satan can deceive Christians too, because in the next verse, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful, for your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion due to what? Seeking someone to devour. And as the pastor said in the video, he's seeking to destroy your Christian faith, to ruin your spiritual vitality, and basically take you out of commission. James, uh, James 4, 7 says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. Well, if we couldn't be oppressed, there would no need to resist. But we can be oppressed, so therefore resist the devil and he will flee from you. What does that tell you? That tells you that if you resist the devil in the means by the means that God has given, you will win every time. Hebrews 2.14 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. The power of death, the threat of death. The devil uses the threat of death to scare people into submission to him. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. this is a biggie, and I could do uh, 10 Bible studies just on this. But no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. So the enemy can oppress Christians by bringing false doctrine, false teaching, false prophecies, false manifestations to deceive the elect. Let's remember that. And then finally, Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, 
against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So these verses definitely tell us that yes, Christians can oppress believers, but to what extent? Could somebody answer the question before we continue? To what extent can Satan oppress believers? That's a very important question. What's the answer to that? Well, the Bible says that uh, God will not tempt us beyond what we can uh, what we can take. So He knows our our limitations. So He's able to limit uh, the devil in, in in that purpose. Okay, so He's He'll provide what, He'll provide a way out as well. All right, to the extent that God allows, which is within our scope to escape. All right, that's one thing. Anybody else? To what extent are believers oppressed? To the extent that we recognize that it's Him causing the attack ah okay it's very important to be able to discern the attack of the enemy when it's coming and it's not the flesh and it's not circumstances and it's not that you had pizza at 12 o'clock midnight and got sick the next morning and it's not because your boss is a crumb so it's important <laughs> it's important to be able to discern someone else to what extent can believers be oppressed by the devil anyone it's a deception 90 percent of the time it's a lie and a deception I would okay. Uh, you say ninety percent of the time. I'll I'll leave you with that. I don't know what the percentage is exactly, but well, deception, most of the, most of the time, deception is a very big part of the devil's arsenal for sure. Anyone else? To what extent will believers be oppressed? I would also add. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, the extent to which they don't repent, the extent to which they're not willing to repent from sin and stay trapped in it. You're sure right about that. That's right. That's another extent. And there's one more. That's kind of the flip side of the coin of not repenting. To what extent will believers be oppressed? <clears throat> to the um, part, up to the extent of their knowledge of the word also, because the Lord did say that his people are dying because of lack of knowledge. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see what the scripture says. Let's go to it. Very good so far, everybody. I hope that you're learning something. To what extent can believers be oppressed? Well, in order to understand that, we need to assess demonic oppression and attacks. Assess them from the very lightest to the very worst. So here we go. These are the levels of demonic attack. But before we do that, we need to understand that there is no word in the scripture for possession, the concept of being possessed by the devil. In fact, the Greek word used for any kind of demonic affliction is called Demonismeni or demonize, which means to be demonized. It's a general term for demon oppression that suggests that there are degrees of demonic activity. Degrees. So demon to be demonized can be something that's a light affliction, or it can be something that is a horrible, horrible situation. So here are the degrees of demonic oppression. First of all, one, level one, I'll call it, temptation to sin, negative thoughts. Self-depreciation, that is beating up on yourself, thinking that you're no good, thinking that you'll never succeed, thinking that you're not pleasing God. Condemnation, because of some sin, you can't get over it, you, you don't believe that Jesus will forgive you. Discouragement, depression, hopelessness, etc. That's level one. Level two, emotional attacks, anger, hatred, jealousy, disappointment, heartbreak, confusion, Excessive fear, anxiety, discontent, uh, discontent, unforgiveness. You can see that these are directed to the emotions and these here are directed to the mind. Let's move on to level three. Strongholds of sin, lust, greed, obsession, pride, vengeance, unbelief, anger at God, rebellion, substance abuse, addictions to pornography, to food, to sugar, uh, to television, whatever. <laughs> Addictions of different kinds. So that's level three. Level one, the mind. Level two, emotions. Level three, the passions of the flesh and the desires of the will. Level four, this is uh, one that you really don't want to happen to you. This gets a little more serious. Evil visions, apparitions, in other words, demons appearing to you. Satanic dreams, voices, threatening voices, curses, either from human sources or from spiritual sources, supernatural occurrences, 
that are not of God. Now we're getting very serious because level four, the enemy is starting to manifest himself, which is not a great situation. And finally, uh, no, then there's level five, sorry. Sickness, disease, persecution, attempted murder, and death. And these happen, uh, these, this level five happens a lot to missionaries I, I, for some reason. I think because missionaries are so consecrated and so dedicated that that's the only way that the enemy can stop them is th through these direct threats. So that's level five. And level six is what we would normally call possession, but it's actually the highest and the most intense form of demonization. And that is control of the body, mind, and spirit and the actions and the will. Total control. And it is the most intense form of demonization, which is commonly classified as possession. Now, mark this last one because it's very important as we go on to our next point. Now we got to ask ourselves the question. Come on, down we go. Now here are examples of, this, of Satan's work from the word of God. And these examples come from level five and level six. Here they are. I'm going to read you the scriptures. Here they are. John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. So murder it has nothing to do with the truth because the truth is not in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Lies. First Samuel 16, 14 to 16. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. An evil spirit from the Lord? How can that be? Well, we established that the devil has no power over anyone unless the Lord allows him. And that just reinforces that fact. Saul's servants then said to him, behold, now an evil spirit from God is terrorizing you. So the devil can use terror. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you. Let them seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you, that he shall pray the, play the harp with his hand, and you will be well. So torment, mental torment. Matthew 7, 15. Lord, have mercy on my son because he is a lunatic and very ill. He falls into the fire and often into the water. Now demonic affliction is getting very serious because it is affecting the mind and the body. And it seems like the devil has taken over this poor boy and uh, really abusing him to, the, to a high level. Then we go on to Luke 9, 39 to 42. Another example of severe demonization. A spirit seizes him. So the devil can seize people. And he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions with foaming at the mouth. And only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. Wow. I begged your disciples to cast it out and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Then Mark 5, this is talking about Legion, the demoniac. He was constantly screaming night and day amongst the tombs and in the mountains, gashing himself with stones. So self-mutilation is another way that the enemy attacks. Those who came to hear him were healed of their diseases and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured. So he can trouble you in many ways. This is kind of general. We don't know how he can trouble you, but he knows that he is looking. We know that he's looking for trouble. First Timothy four, this is a biggie. Now the spirit expressively says that in the last dime, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. So the devil can oppress through false teaching. Now, to what degree can he terrorize believers? Common demonization of believers is from one to four. That's common. In other words, let's go to one. One, two, three, and four. So these things can happen to believers. Those are common. Uncommon demonization is level five. That can happen to believers too, but it's very rare and it and it's very but it's quite common amongst missionaries. And finally, number six, which is total control of the enemy over a life, is impossible for the Christian since a believer is in, indwelt and led by the spirit, because the devil cannot oppress the spirit 
he can only oppress the flesh. And generally, he oppresses the flesh through his standard temptations, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Can somebody describe to me what the lust of the eye is? These are the common temptations. What's the lust of the eye? Can somebody describe it or summarize it for me? Visual desires. Okay, visual desires. I see it, I want it, and I'm going to lose sleep and drive myself crazy until I get it. That's the lust of the eye. Oh, you like my new car? Oh, is that ever cool, eh? How do you like my new jacket? I just bought a pair of shoes. Do you like the makeup and the hairdo I just got? But, of course, it's okay to like those things, but not to be obsessed. The lust of the flesh, what's that? Anyone? Lust of the flesh. Another common attack of the enemy. He tempts us through the lust of the flesh. Pornography, there's one. Give me another one. Gluttony, there's another one. Give me another one. Lust of the flesh. Oh, you guys. Gluttony. Uh, yep, I said gluttony. Thank you. Good. Uh, something else? Lust of the flesh. Substance abuse. Ah, oh, substance abuse. Good one. Good what one. Does, What's sorry, that? Pastor, what does it mean? The one you said before, gl gluttony? Gluttony, me gluttony means to live to eat instead of to eat to live. Okay. Ah, gluton. Okay. Ah, you got it. Good. Okay. I think the French have a problem with that. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. French cooking. <laughs> French cooking. <laughs> you got to watch those French cooks. That's not as so much for buffet. French, French cookies. Not as <laughs> okay. All right. Any other laziness? Laziness what? and comfort, overindulging and comfort. Okay, overindulging and comfort. I think we got the idea. The passions of the flesh. That's the lust of the flesh. And the pride of life. How can the where does the enemy attack on the pride of life? Oh, this is a little more difficult. Exalting pride. oneself. Okay, exalting oneself. Anything else? Status, prestige. Ah, status and prestige. Lusting after status and prestige, yes. Or being proud of your status and prestige. Anything else on the pride of life? Power. Power, yeah, sure. Anything else on the pride of life? What about you, Caroline? What would you say? They pretty much said the ones I have thought of. Okay. So I'll summarize all three. Lust of the eye, I see it, I want it, and I'm going to drive myself crazy until I get it, because once I get it, I can show it off. Lust of the flesh, I have an itch, <laughs> a desire, and I must fulfill that desire. And the pride of life, look at me. Look at who I am. Look at what I've done. Look at my accomplishments. Look at my trophies. Oh, I'm so great. That's the pride of life. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Now, the devil operates in the mind and the emotions, and if he can, the will, but he cannot operate in the spirit of somebody who's born again. He is effectively dealt with if he's confronted by true, born-again, spirit-filled, fully devoted believers. Now, he's effectively dealt by people like that, but he's not effectively dealt by people who are not devoted, because demons will try to find a reason to stay put. If they don't see Jesus fully in you, you are in trouble. So being half-hearted will not do. And since he cannot affect the Holy Spirit in you, he will try to get a grip on your mind and your soul, which is the seat of your emotions and your will. So he can harass believers if they allow it and open the door. But open the door to what? The spirit? No, because he cannot affect the spirit. So where they would open the door to the enemy would be in the mind and in the soul, which is the will and the emotions. That's the only place where the enemy can harass. So we've got to guard ourselves. Now, how do you think the devil can, can get an open door into your life? Anyone? Now, we, we know he can only attack in the mind and the emotions and the will and the soul. So how can he get a foot? What, what would be a way that he would get into you, that he would oppress you? Well, what if you're grieving the spirit? That is within if you, you. If you grieve the spirit, yeah, that's one way. Yep, good. Someone else? 
If you're like living when you in disobey sin. the word of God. You disobey the word so, of God, yes. Uh, an example, even in um, even in the finances, God says that if you don't give him the tithe, or actually he says, if you give bring him the tithes, then he's going to rebuke the devourer. So the second we don't pay our tithes, the enemy is more than happy to devour our finances. Okay, that's disobedience to the word of God, right. Okay, Tom, you had one? Yeah, along the same lines. If you're if you're sinning, if you're if you're not uh, walking with God. Okay, if you're sinning and what? What about you, Davis? What will give the devil an open door? What you listen to, what you watch. Oh. Basically, your your sense of perception, anything you're using, perceiving. Anything you allow into your heart, into your soul, into your heart. Okay, good. All right, and one more. How can we, how do believers open the door for the enemy to attack and harass? I think when it's, you're bombarded with uh, negativity, bad influences. I mean, even if you're strong at the beginning of the day, if all day long you're bombarded and I'm taking him, I mean, I'm yeah, thinking about my I'm thinking about my job. I mean, all day long when I have people yelling, screaming, who have been doing the words you can imagine in matter of financial fraud whatsoever, at the end of the day, you're losing it and you lose your patience. You lose, and this is exactly where he wants you to okay, go. Okay, so you get worn down by the sins of others. Let's put it that way. Exactly, yes. Yeah, Thank you that's for phrasing true. it. I couldn't phrase it. And that's why we need the body of Christ, brothers and sisters. We need each other. We need to meet frequently. We need to stay connected. Okay, let's see what the word of God has to say about the topic which is right here. Here we go. Here's how the enemy can harass. Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 21. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, that's one way you can deal with it. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. That's a good one. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as has good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give, give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as, Christ, as God in Christ has forgiven you. And that passage will tell you how you can open a door and how you can close the door to the devil, both. Aside from that, what other reasons might believers be oppressed by the enemies? What are other reasons besides these that are in the passage? This, what ones have we not covered? This is a little tougher. Why else would a believer be oppressed by the enemy? Actually, Mark alluded, alluded to it uh, at the beginning of the Bible study. I think if we're not fully surrendered, we hang on to things in our lives that we don't want to give up. That's one. Yep. Anything else? Why else would believers be oppressed by the enemy? No, well, let's take um, a look. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I'll go. Um, there's a, a for strife. Uh, I remember um, when Lisa Gilfin came to talk to us at one point she was sharing. There's this. I don't remember the scripture, but I know it has something to do with that when you when you walk in strife you're opening all kinds of doors uh every evil workings um and she had even shared a personal testimony that went along with that so strife also uh causes oppression to come okay strife that's good all right let's take a look at uh some other reasons one of the reasons why believers might be oppressed is because one past involvement with the occult and practicing occult knowingly or unknowingly. Two, focusing too much on Satan, which invites them into their affairs. That's why I tell people, stop giving the devil credit for every little bad thing that goes wrong. 
because all you do is invite him in. So too much focus on Satan, overemphasis on Satan's activity will, will invite him into your affairs. And another reason, and here's where, Mark, we're going to discuss what you were saying before. The process of salvation may involve deliverance. In other words, when you get saved, you may also need deliverance ministry. Now, here are some examples of that. The Apostle Paul needed to be delivered of his hatred of the Christians. Mary Magdalene had seven demons cast out of her as she was being saved. Legion we know about. All the demons that were in him were sent into a herd of pigs, and he was saved that way. The young girl in the book of Acts who was a fortune teller, she had to be delivered before she was saved. In fact, Paul cast out the demon from her, and then after that, she dedicated her life to the Lord. Now, the process of deliverance and the process of salvation, the salvation is instant, but deliverance may be instantaneous or it may take time. Okay, Mark, now I'll go back to you. Why would it take time? Instantaneous, we understand. There are some people who are delivered of everything the moment they get saved. Others are not delivered of everything. And why would that be, uh, Mark? Well, the only thing I can think of, uh, besides not knowing the answer, is the fact that maybe they're not fully surrendered or they're not fully engaged. Okay, they're the not Lord. fully engaged. Can anyone think of another reason why uh, deliverance might take time even after you're saved? Because of the fears that you may have, because it's a new life, it's a new you. So you may be scared of what's going to happen or how you will be. So you try to hang on to your past because at least you know what it is because you have no clue what's going on when you're okay. away from Jesus. That's actually the right answer. Uh, that is the, the answer. So we're going to find out. The reason that some people need deliverance over a long period of time is because when they get saved, their spirit is born again by the power of God. So they have a new spirit and a new nature. But if the enemy has a stronghold in the mind and in the emotions, such as fear, anger, unforgiveness, uh, maybe addictions to things, those things carry with you. And sometimes when you get saved, they're instantly taken away. But there are other times when they're not taken away. And a process has to take place of deliverance. And uh, sometimes that can take time because the enemy will not let go easily if he's had control of your mind and your emotions before you were saved. So sometimes the past creeps into you, even though now you're saved and you have the spirit of God living in you, you still have to be delivered even though you're saved and the enemy has to be kicked out of those areas of your life. So the last question is, how can we practically defeat Satan? What can we do to keep Satan away or to have authority and victory over him all the time? Anyone? Pastor Alex? Yeah. I, I believe that number one, we got to guard our hearts with all diligence. Part of it flows the issues of life, according to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, and Psalm 37, verse 4, to delight ourselves in the Lord, and he will give us the desires of our hearts. Okay, good answer. Anyone else? How can we have victory and authority over the devil? On a consistent basis, anyone. We need to know that that God is sovereign and not the devil, and we need to know who we are in Christ. Okay, very good. Someone else. Submit to God. To submit to God. Okay, someone else. Brother Jeffrey. Resist, resist, resist the devil and resist. remind him it is written. Ah, okay. I like that. Very good. Someone else. One more. How can we defeat the devil and have authority over him on a consistent basis? Staying on the right path of righteousness. Staying on the right path of righteousness. Okay, well, let's take a look at what answers I put and see how many of them you got. But you all did very well. How can we defeat the devil? Discipleship. Following Jesus all the way in every area of life. That goes a long way to defeating him because there's no open door for him. Two, the renewing of the mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2, present yourself as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and be, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Three, resistance on the part of the oppressed, learning who you are in Christ. So resisting the devil, not allowing him to dominate you, and as Tom said, learning who you are in Christ, that goes a long way in defeating him. 
Next, Zechariah the high priest. Well, this is a story from the book of Zechariah, chapter 3, where this man named Joshua was appointed high priest. And the devil came and accused him, saying he's not worthy to be high priest. And God intervened and said, he's worthy because I have cleansed him. So you've got to remind the devil when he comes to accuse you, you've been uh, delivered by the blood of Jesus. You're sinless. You're innocent before God. And there's nothing that he can pin on you because you have been forgiven. The cultivation of the fruit of the spirit. That's another way we can defeat the devil is cultivating love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Galatians chapter five. Another way we can defeat the devil is to control our emotions, control our anger, control our confusion, control our fear. He has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power, of love, and of sound mind. So let's focus on that and let's forget the past and move on, pressing on towards the upward call of the prize of Christ Jesus. And finally, if necessary, finally, if necessary, you may need the actual act or ministry of deliverance. Let us not downplay that. Sometimes deliverance is necessary. Deliverance comes through prayer, fasting, and commanding the enemy to be cast out. But let's remember one last point before we go. You can't cast out the flesh. What do I mean by that? You can't cast out the flesh. Anyone? You can, you can cast out the devil, but you can't cast out the flesh. What does that mean? Then we'll be with us until the end. It's going to be with us until the end, and it means something else. That if you, can, if you say, in the name of Jesus, come out. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over you. It will not work if the problem is in you. If it's from the old nature, you can pray and confess all you want. It'll never change until you repent and start walking with God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And that is that. Gerhard, would you close in prayer, please? <clears throat> oh, God, I thank you that uh, you could bring us together again. And I thank you for uh, your teaching through Pastor Alex, God. And uh, I pray that you would keep us safe until we meet again next time. And I pray again that uh, the next time could be soon in person. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. I hope you've learned a lot about spiritual warfare, and I hope I've answered some of the questions and filled in some of the blanks. God bless. The recording will be on Facebook or on your messenger tomorrow. Bye-bye now. God bless Bye. you, everybody. Bye. 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 God bless you, boy.